We begin with the call to resign, and one already did, the presidents of UPenn, Harvard, and MIT, who suggested that calls for genocide, specifically genocide of Jewish people, may be acceptable in some contexts. You could see the, what, shock, really, on the faces of members of Congress in that meeting Tuesday. What might have been a committee meeting that went all but unnoticed by the general public instead became a national scandal. Three leaders of three prestigious Ivy League universities could not bring themselves to condemn, without condition, calls for mass murder. Watch. Ms. McGill, at Penn, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct? Yes or no? If the speech turns into conduct, it can be harassment. Yes. I, I am asking, specifically calling for the genocide of Jews, does that constitute bullying or harassment? If it is directed and severe or pervasive, it is harassment. So the answer is yes. It is a context-dependent decision, Congresswoman. It's a context-dependent decision. That's your testimony today. Calling for the genocide of Jews is depending upon the context. That is not bullying or harassment. This is the easiest question to answer yes, Ms. McGill. So is your if testimony it, that it, you will not answer yes? If it uh, is, if the, yes speech or becomes, no. if the speech becomes conduct, it can be harassment, yes. That meeting of the House Higher Education and Workforce Committee was called to examine increasing anti-Semitism on college campuses. Late this week, 72 members of Congress signed a letter calling for all three presidents to resign. South Florida Congressman Mario diaz Balart was one of them, and he is here now to get into that and so much more with us. Congressman, good morning and welcome. Thank you, Glenn. Always a pleasure. Always ours. All right. So the letter that you and others sent was on Friday, Saturday, UPenn President Liz McGill resigned. Right after that, the Board of Trustees chair resigned. Uh, we've yet to see what results might come from the other two university presidents. But first, I want to just get your perspective on that meeting. Uh, you were not on that committee, so you, I know you weren't there, but, but what transpired there and the fallout? Yeah, I, I've seen uh, parts of that uh, testimony, and it's frankly beyond shocking. And again, um, and, and here's the problem, that there are serious consequences for that attitude of allowing, and I would actually add promoting anti-Semitism in our, in our universities, in our education system. And we are seeing it across the country, where uh, if you're a Jewish student right now in a university in the United States, or frankly, if you're a Jew, anywhere in this country right now, you feel, frankly, unsafe. And that is totally unacceptable. But that's not by chance, Glenn. It's because it's been institutionalized and even taught by um, some of our uh, universities, actually most of our universities, and also even entertainment. And it, it's kind of been a cool thing to be anti-Semitic. Uh, and it's just not acceptable because the consequences can be deadly. I just want to sort of go on the record with hate in all forms is unacceptable to all thinking and feeling people, obviously. Um, and that includes on college campuses, hate toward anyone else, be it Islamophobia, uh, gays, blacks, name it. Um, but this particular problem, studies show, has been gobsmackingly increasing. And I want to read from the letter a little bit, kind of to your point. Um, the letter in part says, some of your presidents took to social media to clarify responses after the extended public backlash. They confirmed opposition to genocide, which should not have required cl uh, clarification, the letter says, but often little clarity on your campus's true commitment to protecting vulnerable students. What have you found not just with these three, you and your colleagues have, have been studying other universities, prestigious Ivy League universities, well-known universities. What is happening? Oh, it's unfortunately very, very widespread. Uh, and it's, it's, it's been kind of a institutionalized, accepted thing to be anti-Semitic, uh, to call for the destruction of Israel, uh, to criticize um, Israel and, and to, you know, things that you hear all the time, that it's a apartheid state, uh, asking for the boycott of Israel. These are things that have been going on in uh, education institutions around this country 
for now a few decades, frankly. And some folks have had the attitude, well, yeah, it's not a, it's not good, but so what? Well, unfortunately, we're seeing what so what means, right? Uh, we're seeing folks who are actually demonstrating in favor of Hamas, uh, who are threatening Jewish students, uh, who are threatening Jews around the country. In other words, our institutions of higher education and some other high schools and, and schools as well, by the way, Glenna, have been essence teaching hatred against Jews and institutionalizing hatred against the Jews and actually even worse, because when you hear these chants, that's a few may not understand what it means, but these chants that basically mean kill the Jews, wipe out Israel, and it's normal. And it's actually pushed by institutions of higher learning well, the consequences can be quite deadly. And obviously, it's something that we can't accept. If that was done to any other group, the things that are said about Jews and accepted uh, these attacks on Jews, including Jewish students that have been attacked, uh, if that was done to any other group, there would be mass outrage. And so that's why we are insisting on changes to the attitude of these institutions starting from the top. And how, in a congressional manner, would you advocate, and I know there is a push in the Senate, I believe led by South Florida Senator Marco Rubio, to defund or pull federal funding from institutions. And, and I wonder, I, I, I wanna say that you all in uh, South Florida's Republicans have all signed on to a resolution, same in the House, is that right? Yeah, but I mean, it's actually, I, I will tell you in all fairness, um, and I'm very proud of all my colleagues. Uh, there's one colleague in Florida uh, who actually even voted against a, a resolution condemning Hamas, I believe. But 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 there's very uh, strong bipartisan support for making sure that uh, that that we stand up against this aggressive, you know, frankly, racist, dangerous attitude that has been institutionalized. And so it's not a partisan issue. Uh, there are, there's a, a group of Democrats, uh, the more radical Democrats that are, I would I, you know, that are very, very literally anti-Semitic. Um, but, but, but again, uh, in all truthfulness, the South Florida delegation of Congress, both parties have been very consistent and very strong about standing up against this kind of hate. Uh, and we see the consequences of accepting this kind of anti-Semitism. It's not permissible. By the way, before the attacks in Israel, I also defunded institutions in the bill that funds of you know foreign affairs, which I chair that subcommittee of appropriations. I defund institutions that are anti-Semitic, that call for the destruction of Israel. And so I'm hoping that my colleagues also from the Democrats will stand with me to not accept this kind of attitude, not only in the United States, but we should not be funding institutions, groups, associations, uh, including parts of the United Nations that are equally uh, uh, anti-Semitic and dangerous and attack Israel every single day. Uh, One hundred percent. I don't want to leave anyone out. Every one of South Florida's congressmen yep. and women stand firmly against hate and and for the promotion of peace. Um, and absolutely against anti-Semitism in word and in deed. I, I want to ask you, uh, do you, if there comes to pass a resolution that defunds some of these universities because of these type of actions, how, and speech, how, what kind of criteria do you put in that, that allows for free speech, frankly, because I think you heard the university presidents really going toward, well, you know, speech, this speech is protected. Yeah, and free speech is essential and it has to be protected. But unfortunately, these institutions are not allowing for free speech. They actually censor free speech constantly, particularly uh, from individuals, for example, that are conservative. I mean, they don't allow them on co campus. They allow for the harassment of, of those individuals and even groups on campuses uh, that, that might have a point of view different from the leadership. So um, free speech is essential. But th this is not free speech. What we're talking about is what is not accepted on any campus is hateful speech that goes after particular ethnic groups, uh, minority groups, um, except for, it seems, if you are Jewish, by the way, also if you are conservative. But we're talking about now anti-Semitism, which is on the rise. It has become dangerous and it is unacceptable for Jewish Americans or Jews from around the world to not feel safe on U.S. university campuses and not feel that they can speak out uh, because we've seen uh, case after case 
of individuals who have been punished, for example, even in their graves, because they believe that Israel has the right to exist. Again, unacceptable. Free speech has to always prevail. But what we've seen on campuses is just the opposite, is shutting down speech uh, that fights against anti-Semitism or that believes that Israel uh, has the right to exist, etc. That is, frankly, censored or pressured. That is unacceptable. When we come right back, I want to just quickly get your thoughts on uh, Venezuela, elections, South Florida lawmakers very involved in those and what appears to be a reneging of a deal by Nicolas Maduro. So sit tight. We'll be right back with Congressman Mario diaz Balart. Back now with South Florida Congressman Mario diaz Balart, Republican from Miami. Congressman, I want to talk a little bit about you and your fellow South Florida lawmakers throwing huge support behind a candidate opposing Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro, Maria Corina Machado, uh, an opposition candidate who we see here on the screen waving right now, who appears to be finagled off now of a primary vote by the Maduro government. What are we watching here? Yeah, you know, what's amazing is that the Biden administration gave unilateral uh, uh, concessions, relaxing sanctions against the anti-American narco-terrorist regime in Venezuela um, with a promise from that regime that they would allow for free elections. Now, we warned them. I warned this administration publicly and privately not to give sanctions uh, a relief because we knew what was going to happen. And sure enough, then uh, there were primary elections. This amazing leader, Maria Corina Machado, won you know, dramatic uh, support uh, to be the opposition candidate against Maduro in the elections. And now they've been you know, saying that she can't run, that she can't participate in the elections. They already attacked her and her people, by the way. No surprise. And what has been the response of the Biden administration? Nothing. You know, they haven't even snapped back, uh, snapped back the uh, concessions that they gave to the Maduro regime. It's, it's, this administration has been so dramatically incompetent uh, that it's actually creating a dangerous situation for the national security interests of the United States around the world and for people around the world. And so, so we me... should not be surprised that the world is in flames because of an administration that is beyond inept and feckless. All right, well, you know, in fairness, there is a philosophy of doing things another way, and these uh, lifting of yeah. oil sanctions in return for fair elections seem to many like a, like an interesting way to try to get there. Uh, deadline on that was November 30th, so what are we, in about 10 days ago. Um, and, and to your point, the, the sanctions remain lifted in the face of this move to move elections into a more favorable territory. Uh, it feels like, I, I just want to tell our viewers, um, half of the Venezuelan nationals who live in the United States live in South Florida, and many of them voted in this election. So this is very much a local story. Um, are we watching sort of a replay of what happened with opposition candidate Juan Guaido, who also followed this path with huge, res uh, huge support from South Florida? Yeah, Juan Guaido was the head of the Legislative uh, Assembly, and, and the Constitution says that, that he, in essence, was the interim president. In this case, we have a woman who's been elected in a primary election receiving massive support. Uh, and again, the Biden administration relaxed sanctions, um, in essence, hoping that this election would move forward. But we've seen that the Maduro regime has once again lied. The hard thing to understand, though, Lena, is how this administration continues to fall for these traps. And I would argue that they're not falling for the trap, that they're actually doing this to help the Maduro regime. Look, well, I, I'm not sure I want to go there with somebody here to... Well, they can't be that. either that or they're total, total idiots. And I don't... You know, how can you be so stupid to continue to give sanction relief? This is not the first sanctions that they have, uh, that they have kind of weakened. Uh, to the Maduro regime, they did that, you know, almost the first year of this president after this president got elected, and and the Maduro uh, regime laughs at this administration. The administration continues to look for ways to appease and please the Maduro regime. At least start pressuring the Maduro regime, start tightening tightening sanctions. We haven't seen that. I'm hoping that we will see that. But again, this administration, if they tried to be, uh, you know, harmful on purpose for our national security interests, 
they couldn't do a better job. I don't think they're doing it on purpose, maybe. But I'll tell you what, they're incredibly feckless and um, they can't be this, should I say stupid, with all the respect that I try to give them. Uh, this is hard to understand how they can be so feckless. Well, one day I really feel like we should get a little debate going so that I don't have to be in the position of defending either side. Um, but uh, po point taken from the conservative viewpoint, Congressman, I want to um, just sort of put the puzzle piece into Maduro's threats to move into Guyana. And, and it really seems like some strategy is playing out here that I'm not quite sure I understand. Do you? Well, I mean, you know, uh, thugs will be thugs. Uh, it's very, very important that the United States make it very, very clear that that will not be accepted. Guyana is an ally of the United States. Um, uh, you know, they have found oil and natural gas. It looks like Maduro is trying to claim that for their, uh, for themselves, uh, because they've destroyed the natural gas and oil industry in their own country. So, uh, but again, it's important that the United States stand up and say, no, heck, when you even have the UN, speaking of feckless, right, saying that that's not acceptable, uh, I hope that this administration has sent the, the, a clear message that that will not be tolerated. You can't just do that uh, with impunity. But again, all of this is happening because they see, Maduro and others, see great weakness from the White House. I'm hoping that this administration, and I've told them this time and time again, will reconsider um, their, you know, frankly, really, really, really irresponsible attitudes and policies, uh, show some leadership uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen. The last thing we need is another war now in this hemisphere. The world is in flames. Look, Lana, this is a very dangerous world always. That's not the fault of the United States. But when the United States doesn't lead or has poor leadership, then things get out of control. There's a reason why the world is up in flames. And I, I think that buck stops at the desk of President Biden and his administration. On this and so many other issues, we will be watching Congressman Mario diaz Balart. Always great to have you on the program. Always a pleasure, Glenna. Thank you.